welcome to the seventh day of the Edible Campus Earth Week festivities. I'm glad that you're joining us for our last day before Earth Day itself. It's the 50th Earth Day celebration tomorrow, in case you didn't know. Um, anyway, my name is Maya Peterson, and I'm a senior at UNC. I've been involved with Edible Campus my entire time here, and was really looking forward to planning an in-person Earth Day celebration, but we're gonna make the most of a virtual one. So the theme that I'm going to be talking about today is about the way that nature and earth influences art. I am going to do this by sharing a poem that has impacted me. It is called Tintern Abbey by William Wordsworth, and I will share my screen to set the scene. The poem is about Wordsworth coming to a hill and sitting and looking out on Tintern Abbey, which this photo supposedly is showing. So in the poem, he talks about how he hasn't been to this place, to this viewing spot of Tintern Abbey in five years, and how so much has happened in that period of time. Life happens, and yet nature is still there. Left alone, nature will always be there. And this really speaks to me in the time of COVID when we're all isolated and in a way letting earth and nature just be. It also speaks to me since I'm a senior about to graduate and a big thing that seniors do, especially seniors stuck in quarantine with lots of free time on their hands is reflect. Just as Wordsworth sits out in nature and reflects on how his life has changed in the five years since he's been to Tintern Abbey, I've spent a lot of time sitting and reflecting on the ways my life has changed in my four years of college. And yet again, nature is still there. I'll be returning home to Colorado when it's safe to do so. And I will of course go on some of my favorite hikes around the Rockies before starting whatever job it is I do next year. But one thing I know I can for sure count on is that when I go into nature, it will be just like it was. Nature remains and nature will exist long after William Wordsworth's lifetime, long after my lifetime, long after my great grandchildren's lifetime. Given that we protect it and don't over extract from it and don't abuse it, nature will be around. Nature is our home, which is part of our theme for this Earth Week. Protect our home, love our home, celebrate our home, the earth. And so though this isn't inherently a poem about calling people to protect nature, I believe that Wordsworth's ability to paint beautiful and scenic outdoor landscapes with intricately crafted lines of prose does the job really well. Toward the end of the poem, Wordsworth hints at the truest parts of what it means to be human, the acts of kindness and of love. And I think now more than ever, we can all benefit from hearing those lines, those reminders about the ways humanity lifts each other up. So I hope that whoever is still listening, especially seniors or those about to graduate, um, enjoy this reflective, bittersweet and beautiful poem called Tintern Abbey. I hand wrote it in my notebook and it's a little long, so be prepared. It might take 10 or 15 minutes, but it's a wonderful listen. Tintern Abbey by William Wordsworth. Five years have passed five summers with the length of five long winters. And again, I hear these waters rolling from their mountain springs with a soft inland murmur. Once again, do I behold these steep and lofty cliffs that on a wild secluded scene impress thoughts of more deep seclusion and connect the landscape with the quiet of the sky. The day has come when I again repose here under this dark sycamore and view these plots of cottage ground, these orchard tufts, which at this season with their unripe fruits are clad in one green hue and lose themselves mid groves and copses. Once again, I see those hedgerows, hardly hedgerows, little lines of sportive wood run wild. These pastoral farms green to the very door and wreaths of smoke sent up in silence from among the trees. With some uncertain notice, as might seem of vagrant dwellers in the houseless woods, or of some hermit's cave, where by his fire, the hermit sits alone. These beauteous forms through a long absence have not been to me as is a landscape to a blind man's eye, but oft in lonely rooms and mid the din of towns and cities, I have owed to them 
in hours of weariness, sensations sweet, felt in the blood and felt along the heart. And passing even into my purer mind with tranquil restoration, feelings too of unremembered pleasure, such perhaps as have no slight or trivial influence on that best fortune of a good man's life. His little, nameless, unremembered acts of kindness and of love, nor less I trust to them I may have owed another gift of aspect more sublime. That blessed mood in which, the, in which the burden of the mystery, in which the heavy and the weary weight of all this unintelligible world is lightened. That serene and blessed mood in which the affections gently lead us on until the breath of this corporeal frame and even the motion of our human blood almost suspended, we are laid asleep in body and become a living soul. While with an eye made quiet by the power of harmony and the deep power of joy, we see into the life of things. If this be but a vain belief, yet oh how oft in darkness and amid the many shapes of joyless daylight, when the fretful stir unprofitable and the fever of the world have hung upon the beatings of my heart, how often, spirit, have I turned to thee, O Sylvan Y, thou wanderer through the woods? How often has my spirit turned to thee? And now with gleams of half-extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint, and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. While here I stand, not only with the sense of, pleasant pre of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years. And so I dare to hope, though changed no doubt from what I was when first I came among these hills, when like a row I bounded o'er the mountains, by the sides of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads than one who sought the thing he loved. For nature then, the coarser pleasures of my boyish days and their glad animal movements all gone by, to me was all in all. I cannot paint what then I was. The sounding cataract haunted me like a passion. The tall rock, the mountain, and the deep and gloomy wood, their colors and their forms were then to me an appetite, a feeling and a love that had no need of a remoter charm by thought supplied, nor any interest unborrowed from the eye. That time is past, and all its aching joys are now no more, and all its dizzy raptures. Not for this faint I, nor mourn, nor murmur, other gifts have followed. For such loss, I would believe abundant recompense. For I have learned to look on nature, not as in the hour of thoughtless youth, but hearing oftentimes the still sad music of humanity, nor harsh, nor grating, though of ample power to chasten and subdue. And I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime, something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns and the round ocean and the living air, the blue sky and the mind of men, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, it rolls through all things. Therefore am I still a lover of the meadows and the woods and mountains and of all that we behold from this green earth. Of all the mighty world of eye and ear, both what they half create and what perceive. Well pleased to recognize in nature and the language of the sense, the anchor of my purest thoughts, the nurse, the guide, the guardian of my heart and soul of all my moral being. Nor perchance, if I were not thus taught, should I the more suffer my genial spirits to decay. For thou art with me here upon the banks of this fair river. Thou, my dearest friend, my dear, dear friend, and in thy voice I catch the language of my former heart and read my former pleasures in the shooting lights of thy wild eyes. Oh, yet a little while may I behold in thee what I was once, my dear, dear sister. And this prayer I make, knowing that nature never did betray the heart that loved her. Tis her privilege through all the years of this our life to lead from joy to joy. For she can so inform the mind that is within us, so impress with quickness and quietness and beauty, and so feed with lofty thoughts that neither evil tongues, rash judgment, nor the sneers of selfish men 
nor greetings where no kindness is, nor all the dreary intercourse of daily life shall e'er prevail against us or disturb our cheerful faith. That all which we behold is full of blessings. Therefore, let the moon shine on thee in thy solitary walk, and let the misty mountain winds be free to blow against thee. And in after years, when these wild ecstasies shall be matured into a sober pleasure, when thy mind shall be a mansion for all lovely forms, thy memory be as a dwelling place for all sweet sounds and harmonies. Oh, then, if solitude or fear or pain or grief should be thy portion, with what healing thoughts of tender joy wilt thou remember me, and these my exhortations. Nor perchance, if I should be where I no more can hear thy voice, nor catch from thy wild eyes these gleams of past existence, wilt thou then forget that on the banks of this delightful stream we stood together, and that I, so long a worshiper of nature, hither came, unwearied in that service, rather say with warmer love, oh, with far deeper zeal of holier love, nor wilt thou then forget that after many wanderings, many years of absence, these steep woods and lofty cliffs and this green pastoral landscape were to me more dear, both for themselves and for thy sake. The end of that poem. Um, anyway, I hope that you enjoyed it, took from it what you will, thought about people that maybe you haven't thought about in a while or places you haven't been in a while or just you had some good reflection time. Anyway, um, that's the end of my bit and happy almost Earth Day. Bye.